Hello everyone, over the next few videos I want to take an updated approach and review molecular geometry, orbital hybridization, molecular orbital theory, and more, hopefully reviewing the material in a more detailed and consecutive manner. In this first video, let's revisit the ideals behind molecular geometry and valence shell electron pair repulsion, or VSEPR for short. In the earlier stages of studying chemistry, when we were learning about atomic theory and bond formation, we learned that the protons and neutrons exist in the nucleus of the atom, the dense center, and that the electrons exist in a different energetic probabilities around the nucleus that we later learned as atomic orbitals. The protons are positively charged, neutrons are neutral, and finally the electrons are negatively charged. And when analyzing the formation of different chemical bonds, we are focusing on how the electrons between different atoms interact. In the case for covalent bonds, the bonding type that is a sharing of electrons mostly seen between two non-metallic atoms. And in the case of two or more atoms, we usually focus around a central atom of the molecule and the branching bonding groups from that central atom. This is where we begin our discussion of molecular geometry. When discussing the formation of molecular geometries, our smallest arrangement will be three atoms, two bonding atoms on a central atom. Since there is a minimal concern of placement and arrangement of atoms in molecules that consist of only two atoms, such as nitrogen or oxygen, the nucleus is a small dense portion of any atom. So when considering the environment of an atom, bonding atoms, or even bonding groups of a molecule, we are concerned if they get too close to one another because of repulsive forces from light charges. This will drastically increase the potential energy, something molecules want to minimize. Simply based off minimizing repulsive forces within a molecule, VSEPR models were projected. These models do not reflect electronic characteristics of bonds, but provide insights of molecular geometry based off the number of bonding groups we have on a specific atom, also including the central atom surrounding pairs. For example, if we have two bonding groups attached to a central atom, the most effective formation to minimize repulsive forces between those two groups is to have each of the groups farthest away possible. In this case, forming a linear geometry with each group on the opposite end is the most efficient, as seen in molecules like carbon dioxide or ethyne. As we analyze more geometries, remember that there is a goal to optimally minimize repulsive forces with each new geometry we analyze. As we move forward to other examples, let's clarify some definitions first. Electron pairs or electron groups reflect any bond or lone pair around that central atom, any groups or segment that hold electrons. Bonding groups only refer to the number of other bonding atoms, where lone pairs refer to paired electron sets belonging only to the central atom. Moving forward, if we have three electron pairs, which are all from the three bonding groups on a central atom. The central atom will arrange the groups in a trigonal plane of geometry, separating each group at a 120 degree angle on the plane. If we had four groups around a central atom with zero lone pairs belonging to that atom, the central atom will arrange its groups in a tetrahedral orientation to minimize repulsion. Two groups on the plane, one projecting away, and the last projecting out of the plane, each at a 109 degree angle from each other. For five groups, we see a trigonal bipyramidal geometry, where each of the groups are either separated by a 90 or a 120 degree angle, all to minimize repulsive forces between them. In our last example of strictly bonding groups attached to a central atom, we have an octahedral arrangement six bonding groups around the central atom, each separated by a 90 degree angle. For the next set of examples, I want to highlight geometries where the central atom has a number of lone pairs. This alters the geometry, making them asymmetric. Since the lone pairs belong only to the central atom, they sit closer to them. Hence, they have a stronger repulsive force on the bonding groups, 
altering their geometries and creating angular or bent arrangements. I'd like to highlight two examples of geometries with lone pairs, starting with an arrangement where the central atom has four electron pairs, two from lone pairs, and the remaining two from bonding groups, forming an angular geometry. The angles between them are altered beyond what we would think of the 109.5 and instead are closer to 104.5. This is a geometry we can see in molecules such as water, H2O. And finally, trigonal pyramidal geometry, formed with four electron pairs, three belonging to bonding groups, and one from a lone pair. We see a closer angular separation to 109.5 because there's one less lone pair set, but it's still altered around 107.5. In molecular geometry, we see in molecules such as ammonia. Now, these are not the only examples of geometries with lone pairs, and in time, we're going to see more. These are just a few that I wanted to highlight before we move forward. Even though we have no detail about the actual electron behavior or bonding formation when examining molecular geometries and VESPER models, something we'll dive into deeper into coming videos, we could still learn detailed information about the properties of molecules based off their molecular geometries. For example, whether or not a molecule is polar strictly based off its geometry and bonding groups. Remember, for a molecule to be polar, it needs to have at least one polar covalent bond, which is based off the electronegativity difference between bonding atoms and the center atom, and an overall net dipole moment. The dipole moment is a vector quantity having a direction and magnitude. It represents the direction and degree at which an electron density is disturbed. Disturbed enough, and there will be a separation of charges creating a partial positive end and a partial negative end within a molecule. Yet even though a molecule can consist of polar covalent bonds, analyzing the bonding groups and their molecular geometry can tell us whether or not there is a net dipole moment. For example, if the molecule geometry is symmetric, that means that all the bonding groups have an equal pool of electron density on that central atom. The whole molecule itself won't be polar since all of the bonding dipoles cancel each other out since the geometry is symmetric. We see our symmetric molecular geometries in the linear trigonal planar tetrahedral trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral arrangements. This is why we can have a molecule such as tetrafluoromethane, which is a carbon attached to four fluorines. And even though it has strong bond dipoles, the molecule itself is nonpolar. When we start adding lone pairs to our central atom, this is where we see our asymmetric shapes, since the lone pairs tweak the ideal bond angles. And even if we have equal bond dipoles, we'll have an overall net dipole moment within the molecule, making it polar. Well, I hope this video was helpful. Next week, we're going to analyze more about electron geometries, orbital hybridization, and more. By the way, all my free educational resources, like the ones you've seen throughout this video, have been moved to my Kofi account, which allows for an easier download. And I hope you have a great day.